Good evening, everyone, and we want to thank everyone for being here today and thanking those who are online and looking. We truly thank God for this opportunity. We're on, we have two more Wednesdays, today and next Wednesday, and then we go into, next week is Holy Week, which is one of the most sacred weeks, sacred weeks of the Christian faith. Um, and so I do want to open up in prayer because in our capital district today, it's been, it was a sad day, and it's a sad day when anyone, um, unfortunately loses their life in an accident. So let us open up in prayer. Dear God in heaven, we come to you at this time and this moment. First and foremost, God, thanking you just for your grace and mercy to honor who you are and to lift your name. But God, I pray for those, dear God, particularly the two individuals who passed away in a car accident. But God, I pray that, that they had a relationship with you and they knew you and knew of you, God. I pray for their families, dear God, because I'm quite sure when either one of them had their last phone calls or hugs or connections with their family, it was, I'll see you later. We'll talk soon. And yet, today, those two individuals are gone, God. And so, what I ask in our Bible study today, that we continuously think about who you are and remember and know that tomorrow this afternoon, even this evening, is not promised to anyone, any of us. So let us always, God, be on watch. Bless those families who've lost their loved ones, but most importantly, God, give those souls that have returned to you, God, peace. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And so our lesson today um, starts with, um, on last Thursday, uh, Fools for Christ. I want to read each one and then we'll go through them. It's Fools for Christ, Broken People, um, Broken People, A Broken Heart, Our Comforter, From Sadness to Gladness, The Sting of Death, and I'll See You Again. And so, Fools for Christ. It says here in 1 Corinthians 1, 18, 24, the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And I'll read this part, and then I'll let anyone open up. It says, to his, to his two disciples who were dejected after his suffering and death, Jesus says, you foolish people, slow to believe all that the prophets have said. Was it not necessary that Christ would suffer and so enter into his glory? The cross is a symbol of death, of death and of life, of suffering and joy, defeat and of victory. It's the cross that shows us the way. And so to his two disciples who were dejected. I can only imagine for this second Jesus speaking to his disciples about his suffering. And just like all of us, um, many of us, when we, when we look at evil taking place, we expect God to come in and correct it. And we be the victors. And yet we find Christ saying to them that this is part of the journey of suffering. And so I just want to get your perspective on what it means to be a fool for Christ. What does that mean? It's loaded. Because when you say the word fool, if I said the word fool to you, if I said they're a fool, what would you think? Be honest. They did something stupid. They did something stupid. Exactly. What else? Think about it. So they did something stupid. He's a fool. She's a fool. <clears throat> but I got a second part to that that I haven't shared yet when I'm talking. Oh, they're like court gestures. They want to just attract ha 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 <clears throat> so people will laugh at them. Gotcha. Like there was a musical on Broadway and a movie 
of God's L where they all dressed up. I remember that. I remember that it's called so yeah on Broadway, yes. Yeah. So if we look at being a fool for Christ from that perspective, <clears throat> it's not a bad thing. Right. But 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 well, we didn't have the Christ part. <clears throat> okay, but we do. <laughs> <laughs> so what does that so so from, from your perspective, you and you're right. What does that mean though? What, what does it mean to be a fool for Christ? To be an evangelist. Okay. In mm -hmm. in thought, word, and deed. Okay. And it also makes me mindful. I, I had a conversation with someone yesterday about how it's much easier sometimes to celebrate Christmas mm. and that some denominations in the church focus mm. more on Christmas mm -hmm. than they do on Easter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can't have one without the other, That's really. Right. That's right. That's right. And my mother said when I was very, very young, she said, you know, we are an Easter people. Mm. And I've always carried that in my life. And so I'm glad from the, the evangelist perspective of being a fool. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to be a fool. Okay. Okay. And someone who was newly ordained in, in the Episcopal Church, which is my faith tradition, um, came to my house to give me communion after I'd been in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And I was telling him about a it was a near-death experience, and I'd never thought that I would believe in that until I had one. Mm. And so he and I were talking about that, and we were on the front porch. It was a nice day, and he could see um, in the window there was a, a stained glass of the Episcopal Church shield. Mm. And he said, when did you convert? And I said, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. He said, well, when did you join the church? I said, I don't understand your question. Mm -hmm. And he, he asked the question five or six different ways. And I said, well, I was born into the church. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh. He said, well, he said, I only ask because you have the evangelistic fervor of a convert. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I was paying attention in Sunday school. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. So, I think if we're doing it right, we're all fools for Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. And there's Amen. plenty of room for that kind of foolishness. It, it is. Right, Joanne? Yes. It is. It is. <laughs> Anything you say, Louis. <laughs> no, no, but I like that, though. I, 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 I um... I like that. I like what you just said. It, it, there's, there's room for all of us with it, you know. And uh, when I just to give my perspective on it, and I thank you for sharing that, Lewis, brother Lewis, because that's so true. There is a lot, and it's good to be a fool for Christ. But I, I remember one of my theologian friends saying, David Jeremiah saying that Christians are peculiar people. You know, strange, not fully understood. Sure. Misunderstood, you know, and that kind of leads to what you were saying about that. It's if we use the first part, like you said, but we're saying we're fools for Christ, and when we're fools for Christ, there is no shame, even though you might not understand it. There's no, there's no shame in it, you know. And you know, um, I found that very, uh, very uh, taking, and I. I I don't know if anyone else wants to share, but I'll just say, and I wrote at the end, to be a fool for Christ is for your life to reflect Christ. And so I can think about when I'm in these, I know for me, when I'm in these difficult situations and difficult conversations, I say to myself, what would Christ say? You know, if somebody's coming at me, you know, somebody's questioning well, what would Christ say in that? What, what, what would, 
And the only thing that I really have to go on, I don't know about you guys, the only thing I have to go on is what he would say. I don't really have anything else to go on. I can give you my opinion. My opinion don't, it don't amount to much as far as I'm concerned, because it's my opinion. It's important to me. Um, but I would think, what would Christ say? You know, if I was, if I was uh, approached in a difficult way, what, what would Christ do? You know, uh, so... I don't know if anybody's going to add that, what I just said. Not that I said anything profound, I just said, you know, what would Christ do? When I was at my fraternity brother's funeral, it said, what would E.D. do? <laughs> His name was, what would Eric Duvall do? Oh. You know, and, and, um, and I thought about that, because it says, what would Charles do? Mm. What would Charles do? Mm. You know? My uh, fraternity brother says, and I saw them, they said, the... If you see a lot of them around, if you're around them long enough, the first thing they will come is they will tease me a lot. On my wall, when I retired, I had some on my wall, and they called them Charlesisms. <laughs> One of the Charlesisms in the fraternity is when I look up, I walk up to y'all, say things like, "Louis, you look good. John, you look good. Karen, you look good." <laughs> John, you look good. So are you lying? Yeah, no, I'm oh. serious. <laughs> because when I see you, okay. no matter what you think you look like, oh, you, look you look good. good. Okay. I got, and that's my mantra. Okay. You look good. Do you so they joke, they tease me by that. Do you say it to yourself in the mirror? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Even though I don't. <laughs> Even though I do. I'm, 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 and I say that to say that because that word for me is because it's, it's, it's there's one thing me and God is connected on. I don't know. I don't know any other gift I have, but the one gift I know that me and God can, and me and God can hand wrestle on, <laughs> is that I'm an encourager. I'm an encourager. I don't care where you are in your life. I don't care what you've done in your life. I don't care how far you. I don't care how low you've fallen or how high you go. I'm going to encourage. You ain't going to never hear nothing come out of our mouth that says that Joanne can't do that. Or oh, Joanne made a bad decision. That's not me. Even though everybody else might say, that's not a good decision. And I say that because death is in the life and death is in the tongue. You, you want to destroy a child, you never have to put your hand on them. Just say some things to them. You say some things to a child, and you can destroy their life. You can destroy them. Tell them they're not good enough. Tell them they're fat. Mm -hmm. Tell them they're not worthy. Watch. Watch what happens. And I've seen it. I've lived it. You know, and so for me, mm -mm. nope. So anyway, moving right along. Um, so we, we don't want to go off track. If, if anyone else have anything else to say, um, we're moving on to broken, broken people. And on this uh, uh, April 1st, it says, Yes, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. John 3, 14-15. This says, Oh, Jesus... You who drew all people to yourself as you lifted up in your pain and in your glory. You stayed with us as the wounded and risen Lord. Whenever I touch your broken heart, I touch the hearts of your broken people. And whoever, when, whenever I touch the hearts of your broken people, I touch your heart. Your heart and the broken people of the world are one. Any comments? It makes me think of a confirmation student I had more years ago than I want to think about, <laughs> who said, if Jesus was human, mm -hmm. and we as humans are all broken, mm -hmm. it seemed impossible to this student that we could place all of our devotion mm -hmm. onto Jesus, mm -hmm. who was a man. Mm -hmm. And he said, so how would you, that's, that's too much. Don't you think that's too much? 
Mm. I thought about it for a little while. I said, well, no. I said, it's not too much. I said, because Jesus was lifted up on the cross. Mm -hmm. And that, that took care of it. Mm -hmm. That lifts us up. It lifts me up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that person is about to be ordained to the priesthood in two years mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now. So hopefully something I said made sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's part of his journey. It will, it will, you know, it will, you know. And I'm, I'm glad and that's a great illustration of showing how Jesus took everything. And took it to the cross. We can't be fixed if we're not broken. Yeah. True that. You know, it's funny you said that because what I was saying today was some of the best sermons and testimonies I've heard in my life have come from broken people. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it literally has come from broken people. You know, and, and, um, and uh, one of our old Episcopal supervisors used to say, you want my glory but you don't know my story. Mm. And she was basically saying is, you see all that I've done well, mm. but you don't know the hell that I've been through. And it comes back to the brokenness part. Like you said that, you know, Jesus took it all for us. And, and broken people, you know, um, I wrote here, it's the greatest way to help your broken heart is to help someone with a broken heart. You know, and, um, and now I can understand a little bit more about uh, Alcohol Anonymous, grieve it, grieve it, uh, groups that grieve, you know, people who've lost loved ones. You know, I, I say one of the greatest things any human being should do is that when you've lost, you've had some real pain in your life, attached to somebody else, attached to groups of people who are struggling through that too. Because you can find encouragement and upliftness in that brokenness. Anyone else? About That's broken why heart? he came, right? That's he right. had to be right at that spot. Mm -hmm. It's the thing about the cross is either being repulsive and foolish mm -hmm. or the most beautiful thing that could never even have happened. Mm -hmm. It's like called um, J.R. Tolkien. Called, you know, when you, if you have a train wreck or that the ship sinks like a Titanic, mm -hmm. it's a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Well, what the gospel shows is a catastrophe. It's like the good, the opposite of a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. So good you couldn't even believe it. And Jesus came to be right at that intersection. Mm -hmm. And that's why the cross is, to us, it's so attractive. Right. It's at the corner of hope and, and, um, and affirmation, hope and you know, oh good, we won after all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like at the corner of Washington Town. Yes. I guess that's why we call it Good Friday. I always struggled as a kid why they called it Good Friday, you know. Yeah. You know, I always say, well, why do they call it Good Friday? Yeah. And, I, and I didn't understand until I became an adult. Sure. And I, you know what I mean, that I, I began to understand. You know, one of the things that I'm going to be preaching next week at the Lutheran Church, my, my, uh, I, my uh, title is when Jesus says, it's finished. And um, I've had a great, well, I've, I've read a lot on, you know, so one of the things I've said to people, and I've gotten a lot of kickback, particularly with other people, I say that uh, we go to Jesus for forgiveness, but Jesus already did it at the cross. And so I used to listen to this program years ago. They used to say things like, why do you go to Christ for forgiveness when he's already done it? So then I, I, in my study of the word, would go and say, when I go to God for forgiveness, I hear God saying to me, Charles, I've already taken care of that at the cross. But why don't you ask me to give you strength so you don't do it again? So now my prayers are, God, I know you took this away. I know you took away every sin that I'm dealing with. You took it away. God, give me the strength to resist it. Give me to resist the sin. Give me the strength to, be, to pull away from it. Because I, I can hear God saying to me, my go and sit down at the cross. I used to, at, at my church, we used to sit at the altar. They say, lay it at the altar. And I remember I could hear God saying to me, 
Why are you asking me for this again? I took care of it, Charles. When I said it was finished, it was finished. Past, present, and future. And so, when I say that to people, people are like, oh, no, no, you got to ask for forgiveness every day. And I'm like, eh. And I say to them, but Jesus ain't going to the cross every day for me. He ain't going to the cross every day for Lewis. He's not going to the cross every day for Sharon and John, or Gina and Joanne, or John, or those online. He took care of it. And that's, and that's, and that's the complete, that's why the cross is so beautiful. Because it represents, that old rugged cross represents, that old rugged cross represents everything I've done in the past, Everything I've done now, everything in the future. And that's why I get, I, I, I want to be a little arrogant here in God. That's why I get my Jewish brothers and sisters and my Muslim brothers and sisters. I'll be like, yeah, yeah. See, I, all that. I said, I'm, I'm with you with Ramadan. Good for you. I'm with you with, you know, all that. Good for you. I said, but listen, I got to say you took care of it. He took care of it. And I said, and I, and I, and I fast in that from the perspective. That because I, ba I bask in knowing that, I can grow in my relationships. And I tell people, I'm more concerned with loving people, right, where they are, and bringing them closer to God, than worrying about what they did last night. The old story, and I'll shut my mouth after this, is this, this minister's in a restaurant. And each week he's celebrating various prostitutes' birthdays. <laughs> Seriously. He's, he's celebrating their birthday every week. With the prostitutes? With the prostitutes. Every <laughs> week he goes, when he finds out there's a particular prostitute birthday, he brings them in the diner with the other prostitutes and celebrate their birthday. And they said, what kind of man would do that? And he said, a man that loves God and a man that loves people. You see, we got to live this gospel. P people already know they in hell. You ain't got to tell people about them being in hell. You ain't got to tell people about their sin. They ain't know more about their sin than anybody else. One of my best friends in the world, I told you we joke every time we say, you know, if one of us die, we're going to have to snuff each other out in the hospital because of fun. Um, if I have no problems, you're going to snuff me out because you know I'm going to tell all your secrets. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, vice versa, I'm going to snuff you out. You know, we're both, we're both pastors. But I say that to say that we joke around we said, listen, if anyone knew what we confessed to God about, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and I ain't murdered nobody, I ain't hurt no kids, right? You know, but Jesus said by fraud, Word and deed. Mm -hmm. That's how I get you. Mm -hmm. These people, because us holy rollers, right? Well, I've never done that. Mm -hmm. I've, never, I've never said those words. I've never thought those thoughts. And Jesus is like, yeah, you have. If you haven't done it, you thought it. If you ain't thought it, you spoke it. And you know that? Let, let me let you get in a rush to go somewhere and let somebody pull and, and, and pull over and jump ahead of you, you'd be like, mm -hmm. words will come out <laughs> that you didn't think you had. I remember, <laughs> I said, my, my father, my aunt, my poor aunt Ernestine, rest her soul, she got an argument with my father, she started trying to curse, and my father said, please, stop that. You, you don't sound right. <laughs> you don't know how to curse. Now, leave that to me. <laughs> Moving right along. I'm sorry. Okay, so the next one is a faithful, faithful forever. Oh, I think no, no, my, my, no, no. I, I, I missed, I missed my part. I'm sorry, no, no. Let me go back. Um, broken heart. Broke our comfort. And um, in this one, it says, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. So you know, John 11:30 is, is the shortest scripture in the Bible. Does anybody know it? I know you know it. Does anybody else remember? It's the shortest. Yes, I know. It's the, it's the shortest scripture in the Bible. It's two words. Anybody remember? Jesus wept. Jesus wept. 
Jesus wept. It's a short, and so now I was sitting there while the son's a little kid. He said, my, my son's the teacher said, if you don't remember nothing else, Jesus wept. You know one scripture. <laughs> Two words. Jesus wept. And Jesus wept because he saw the pain of those around him. He saw the pain in agony. And, and, and you're talking about, as you shared earlier, Louis, with your, uh, your, uh, your, your confirmation student, when he says, how could Jesus do all of that, take on all of that? But he did. He took all of that. He took all of that on. And he wept just like we wept. And, he, and, and Jesus showed his emotion to those who were weeping. And so it says here, we forget that Jesus did not give food to many without being received some loaves or fishes from a stranger in the crowd. That he did not return the boy of Nana to his widowed mother without having felt her sorrow. That he did not raise Lazarus from the grave without tears and a sign of distress. It came straight from the heart. And so he is our example of life. He's also our example of sorrow. He's also our example of weeping. And um, we empathize because Jesus says in 1 John, we love because he first loved. We only know love through God. That, that we in and of ourselves can think we're capable of loving. You can love your partner, you can love your children, but what is it to love somebody who's not lovable? You know, who, 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 who can love? It's really difficult to love somebody who ain't lovable. Who doesn't want to be. Who don't want to be lovable. Who don't want to be loved. Right. And I'm going to tell you something, and, and Sister Joanne, you just said something. We don't want to be loved. But this is, this is, this is, this is, the, this is the Christ movement. That person needs love more than a person who knows love. Mm -hmm. The people to love are the ones who are the most difficult to love. And, and, that's, and that's what was going on in this Holy Week 2,000 years ago. Jesus is loving somebody, loving people who despise him. He's loving people who speak in the truth and love. Like you said, take care of yourself before you retire, Reverend Rogers. Mm -hmm. You see, he's speaking truth. It is so difficult for people to receive mm -hmm. good stuff that's going to help them. Now, you know, ooh, don't tell me that, Joanne. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna start taking care of myself. No, no, you need to take care of yourself before you retire. Mm -hmm. If you get the opportunity to retire, you see, mm -hmm. that's in love. And so, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to hear those things, right? Mm -hmm. That you need to hear. I never forget my mentor used to say to me, "Now, Charles, you better than that." No, think about your teachers. You ever thought about those teachers in school that were so hard on you? Everybody had a hard teacher. Come on, y'all. Everybody. Ain't everybody had a hard teacher? Most of them. Huh? Mo, 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 right? Right? When we look back at it now, right? When I look back at it, it was the teacher that loved me the most. They said, I refuse to accept this. You are better than this. And I'm like, listen, woman, you just, you just being difficult. You just being, you just don't like me. They were like, no, 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 no. You're better than this. Well, that's our comforter. He sees us the same way. When he was talking to the Pharisees, he was saying to them, you're being oppressed by the Roman Empire, and now you're oppressing your people. You're doing the same thing to them, what is being done to you, so you can stay in power. And Jesus was like, you're wrong, you're wrong. And they were like, mm -mm. ain't that Joseph's son? He's a cop. Yeah. You're telling me, don't you know I'm a, I'm a scholar? I'm a scholar. You, you the carpenter son, gonna tell me that I'm doing right. Oh, and by the way, you the Messiah. Yeah. You know, so you know, it's tough. So any 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 comments or questions on that before we move on? Jimmy knew the uh, 
one that quote, gets quoted in each one of the in, in this uh, highlighted area, it says nothing happens without. Mm -hmm. This doesn't happen without. That doesn't happen without. Mm -hmm. And it's just like there's an emotional or a, uh, a feeling that passes through Jesus' heart for everything that he does. Mm -hmm. It isn't just, oh, I'll dial up, I'll feed uh, 7,000 this time. Let, no, let's, you know, well, let's go down to 5,000. Let's dial it, dial it, right. and dial it, punch a button, like mechanical mic. Right. <laughs> and so this is, there's a reason for doing it. Like if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, I deliver up my body to be burned, but don't have love. It benefits me nothing. That's right. He didn't even feel it. He didn't even feel it. Praise God. That's right. Profits me nothing. That's right. That's right. And, it's, and, it's, and he's showing that by our emotional love that he has for us that God wants to display. And that's why I always say to people when we're always looking for God to solve something, you know, God has given us an equipped. I mean, I've said this before. The United States of America to feed the world three times every day. Throw it away. Huh? To throw it away. Mm -hmm. Throw it away. You get it right on the note. We pay farmers not, we pay farmers to destroy food. And we can feed the world, five billion people, three times a day, every day. But we destroy food and we have children in our own country. Well, they also they also pay because I grew up on a farm and they they pay I remember they pay pay my parents not to plant not to plant exactly plant. right and and, and 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 so you know when you talk about when Jesus what did Jesus say I only promised God said he only promised you bread and water he didn't even promise us clothes and we can't even get people clothes so I say to people we look to God we say you know, I heard young people say you know why would God allow this to happen. And I says, well, the question is, why does man, why does, correction, why does human beings, why does human beings allow this to happen when God has given us the tools to solve? I was on the phone with an argument with a parent today talking about the COVID shot. She's a pastor, and a nurse, and she ain't doing, her son ain't doing no boosters, that, that, and this. It's easy for me. I'm like, well, you know what? Well, he, he just can't go to school here now. This ain't, this ain't, the, this ain't, the, this ain't the health department. This is the university at all. If you don't get boosted, he ain't going to school. Well, how can you do that to him? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, that's the rules. Because college ain't a right. It's a privilege. You know? So I say that to say that her perspective was, we don't know what this thing is doing. I'm like, yeah, ma'am, I said, you're yeah, you breathing. You don't know what you breathe. You got a cell phone to your head. You know what that's doing to you? We don't, I mean, we, we don't know, you know? But if you're, a, if you're a person of faith, why are you living in that? I, this then I had to close with door and get in a conversation with her. I said, you're a woman, you tell me you're a pastor. Well, I'm a pastor. What you living in that type of fear for? What you telling your congregation? Mm. You know, do we live by faith or do we live by faith, fear? You know, so I say that to say that going back and going into Monday now from sadness to gladness, that our comforter gives us, that when you talk about the, 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 the page 34, we talk about the, 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 the loaves of bread, the fish and bread, Jesus gave us a demonstration how he took the, the fish and the bread and fed the 5,000, and still had left over. Well, I would say that we have the same ability in our circles, you know, in, in our circles, that we have the same ability, and God has given us that ability to do that. So on Monday it says, from sadness to gladness, I will turn their, mor their mourning into joy, and I will comfort them and give them gladness to sorrow. And this is Jeremiah 31, 13. This is the paradox of expectation indeed, is that those who believe in tomorrow can better live today. And those who expect joy to come out of sadness can discover the beginnings of a new life in the center of the old. And that those who look forward to the returning Lord can discover him already in their midst. This is in our times of sadness and loss, it may seem as if joy and gladness will never return. And um, so I don't know what your feelings on on that statement. 
sums up Easter pretty much. Like I always think about the people who were there. Mm. And they lost they lost their Lord. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they watched it happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what elation after disbelief, I'm sure, mm -hmm. when he's there. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's the sign for outside here will say, after Palm Sunday, mm -hmm. a lot can happen in three days. Sure enough. Sure enough. Because on that Friday, there was only John at the cross. <clears throat> the other ones was running high. He was out there cursing and denying him. <laughs> you know, I just, I say to myself, I always call myself Peter because God knows I, I, boy, I, I have fallen so many times. And you, you're right, that, 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 that sorrow to joy, you know. And then, and I always say, you know, we, 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 try, we try in the church to downplay our women. But not the first, the first Apostle was Mary Magdalene. She was the one who went to the tomb and went to the disciples and said, He is risen. And the definition of an apostle is someone who had served with Jesus and witnessed his resurrection. She was the first. You know, she was afraid. I got a paper for y'all to read in the seminary that I wrote. It's Mary Magdalene, the unofficial apostle. You know what I'm saying? And but again, when you gleam and read the word, right, when you really read the Bible and really read it and don't have somebody dictating it to you, most people miss that. You know, we, we downplay women so low that she was the one who went to. And he said, go tell my disciples and Peter. <laughs> he, they was, he was specific. He didn't say, he said, go tell my disciples and Peter that I miss them. He said, I've seen the Lord. You know, so it's powerful. From like you just said, Lewis, from sorrow to joy. This, those three, I like that three, I'm, I'm loving that, that three-day thing. I like that. When that it, when three days, three days, I had read that one time, I thought that it was, you know, we, we celebrated in three days, but mm -hmm. I, had, I, I thought I had read mm -hmm. uh, that it was longer than three days. Well, what, what, so that's what people, that's what the, the commentary is it was over a period of time that he that he appeared to them, right? But what 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 the Christian what so what many theologians have, 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 have tabled they've tabled that Good Friday happened because we might say it was Friday because that was always the beginning of the Sabbath. Would you remember Jesus was Jewish? Right, right. So you know you know this. So let's go with that. Jesus didn't walk around and call himself a Christian. He says, I'm the new way. I'm the covenant. We gave it the name Christianity. Right. Jesus says, I'm a new, I am, I am covering over the Old Testament. Meaning that I have fulfilled. What Adam did in that garden with Eve, I have fulfilled. And by the way, while he was, while Adam and Eve did that, he's saying, I sent you Jeremiah to speak to y'all, the weeping prophet. I sent Isaiah. I said Ezekiel. I said Micah. I mean, y'all wanted kings? I gave you kings. First kings, second kings. <laughs> no, you know that. First kings, second kings, first chronicles, second chronicles. It talks all about the, all that human beings wanted that God did not want. First Samuel, second Samuel. You know, God didn't want God didn't want them to have that. But he said, if you want to have it, so be it. And one of, and I love what Reverend Smart shared with me, and this was a a light bulb for me. You know, he said, we were talking about the children of Israel in the Old Testament. He said, stop, y'all. He said, those people were in exile. Most of the Old Testament. They were in exile. But these people didn't have no, they were always fighting. They were always trying to protect their land, right? So they were in exile. And I, and I said, you know what? When we read the Old Testament, we think that Israel was, you know, but Israel was always the underdog. But God said, I'm going to keep a remnant. And we have to remember that the last Old Testament was almost, what, 500, 400 years? Was it, was it 400, how many years? Mm -hmm. 470 years, was it, before? Yeah. Something like that? From, from, when, uh, 
from when the exile ended mm -hmm. to when Messiah rode back into Jerusalem. Most rode back into Jerusalem. And we taught, and so we, mm -hmm. we, right, and we go to the first book of Matthew, it's 42, 42 generations to Jesus. You know, from the tribes. 42 generations before you get to Joseph. You know? So now, wasn't, wasn't, and no, nothing. Mm -hmm. sure, no, sure. But wasn't Christ mm -hmm. a term that was used for, like, it was Christ Augusta, the Christ? Yes. Caesar the Christ. Caesar the Christ, right. And he was and Jesus was then called Christ. Right. Because right. he was the leader, the head. Exactly. Of which is which is why you see a lot of a lot of um New Testament scholars will not use Christ. They use Yahweh, mm -hmm. Jehovah. Right. Could they go from the Old Testament of who he was to be? You know what I mean? So again, when you look at Christianity, right, from its context. Christianity can look like almost like a very political move. Well, especially when it's when you Constantine. Christ Christianity. Christian, right. Christianity. Christianity. Yeah, right. That, and, Christ. I, and I've had and I've had friends of mine who believe in Christ who say I'm not a Christian. Right? They say that to me. I'm like, yeah, okay, all right, all right. So I say go further. And they go into that I believe in that He covered my sins. I believe in that, but I believe Christianity was something developed by. Human beings. I mean, you think about the Episcopal Church, mm -hmm. the Methodist Church, the mm -hmm. Listen, that that is all man-made. The church is a divinely inspired institution, mm -hmm. and as my mother used to say, unfortunately, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. operated by humans. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> it is, you know, and 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 with that in mind. And more recently, men. And then most recently men, but now women, God is allowing space. God is, God is opening their doors. I believe that God is opening their doors because God is changing our hearts of men. And let me tell you something. My old church, they said to me, we don't want no woman, and God ain't going to send us a woman. And these are women saying this. Israel even church said, we, we don't want no woman, and God ain't going to send us no woman. Right? So, you know, again, it's, it's, it ain't always men blocking the door. You know, some of them it is, is that it's women. But, but it is in, like he said, God's inspired. But I always say it's God. I always, I'm convinced of this. If Jesus came down here tomorrow, where would he go worship? Would he worship in Israel? <laughs> I hope. <laughs> We're going to be on our best behavior. <laughs> I said, we worship first congregation. We worship Israel. We worship, where, would, where would Christ be? And I would beg to differ and believe, based on what I've read in the Old the New Testament, that Christ would be among the least of these. Mm -hmm. And not the least of these is where we get it wrong. We think the least of these is always by what they wear and what they own. The least of these could be, he could be on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. They are the least of these. Anytime you think your money can save you, you think your possessions can save you, you are a least of these. Because, listen, I, I got friends who say, yo, but I don't need no God. God so ain't put no money in my bank account. I'm like, I said, you didn't hear about the man in the barn that Jesus talked about who, who died. He said, let me build bigger barns. God <laughs> took it. You know that? God took it. God, he said, let me go tell my brothers. He said, oh, no, no. No, no, they need to learn like you did. You know? So, again, we don't know. When we say the least of these, we always talk about poor people. Nah. The least of these is not about this. It's about this. Mm. The heart. That's the least of these. You know? That's the least of these. The reason why poor people, the reason why people with less means tend to have more open hearts is because they have learned, as Paul said, Paul said, I have learned to live with much and I've learned and learned with less, but I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Paul said, I've had it both. I've been a rich man, and I've had where I've had to call on my disciples to send me money, but I can do all things through Christ. So let's move on for the next because I know we get close to 725, and I want to be on time um, um, uh, for all of us. It says, the next one is the sting of death. So some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. What trouble the teacher and other further? But Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. 
Mark 5, 35 through 36. Then it says, once we have tasted the joy and peace that come from being embraced by God's love, we know that all is well and well and will be well. Don't be afraid, Jesus says. I've overcome the powers of death. Come and dwell with me and know that where I am, your God is. Mm -hmm. It says that we know how final death is. I know it's final from the perspective that my father died 22 years ago, and I, ain't, and I haven't talked to him since. I know my good my fraternity brother died last Monday, his funeral was Monday, and I know that I'm not going to talk to him again. But the hope is that one day I believe in my faith that I will see my father again. And I'll see my grandmother. And I'll see my friend Eric. But right now I grieve because they're not with me. And I'm, and I'm going to miss them. I'm going to miss them. I really am. I miss, I miss I think about my father every week. I think about something that he would say, something that would make me laugh. Um, I think of Eric. You know, I'm going to these fraternity meetings now. And uh, I'm hoping that I can mimic his personality and smile and keep my mouth shut. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm hoping. I'm hoping. It's, it's a tall task, Jordan. I'm hoping. I'm hoping. They used to call. You ever see the show George? You ever see the Jeffersons? Yep. So when I was an undergrad, they used to call me George Jefferson. Really? Oh yeah. Oh, I was something else in the meetings. My three brothers would say, "Look at Charles yelling over there, screaming. He can't fight. I couldn't, but I would still talk. Oh God. Oh, oh, oh. I, was, I was something else. I was something else. I was something else." But, I, but, but you know, I, and I say that because I was. Because, you know, the more you, sometimes, the younger you are, the dumber you are. And the dumber you are, the more you think you know and you don't know. And, um, but it, it, it is the brokenness that you talk, the brokenness. When God breaks you, it breaks you, then you become. You become. You become. And I've been, and, I, and I'm, I'm grateful. As though as painful as it's been, I'm grateful. Mm -hmm. So speak, speak of that. I know all of you have lost somebody in your life. And I know that it, it is not, it can't be easy. How did you cope with that? Did well, the first mm -hmm. eight or ten weeks after my mom died, mm -hmm. something would occur to me. And I would go reach for the phone and start dialing the number. I said, oh, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. I, this service doesn't go where she is. <laughs> he can't stop. <laughs> Same with my dad, you know, but after a while, now I've forgotten the phone number. Mm. But with God, we get unlimited free minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yes, unlimited free minutes. Mm. Wow. So if we can talk to God, they're with God. Right. Amen. 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 It can be at peace. Yes. And you know, thank you for sharing that because I think that uh, I think it's in my devotion time and my Bible reading that I begin to get peace with that, enjoy. You know, I um, I think I think we all long know and believe in our hearts and faith. And then you know, I've even had young people that I've worked with say, "Well, Charles." How do you know for sure? And I said, you know, I said, for sure is such a, a, a loaded word. Two words, for sure. I said, all I, all I know for sure now is that this is who you say you are, this is who I say I am, and we're talking. I said, but I believe by faith. I believe by faith. And, and, and I can say this, you know, a young man, young woman asked me, Asian woman asked me, you know, why are you a Christian? I said, because everything that's happened in my life, I don't believe it's an accident. And everything in my life that, I, that I've done wrong and right, I can pick up and find in that book. 
the best form of Christian. And could I find it in a Quran or a Torah? I think we could find it in the Torah. I've read the Quran and the Torah. And the Quran and Torah and the Old Testament talk about one specific thing and one specific thing only. It talks about God's infinite mercy and man's utter failure. Man's utter failure. We are human beings, excuse me, correct me on that. Human beings are failure. Human beings, we muck it up. I, 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 I'm, I, I'm just convinced. We think we get it right in one area, we blow it in another. You know, and so when I think of the sting of death, I think of it from a perspective that the sting of death will, will still burn like fire when a loved one is taken from us. But we can go on living for Jesus in the midst of our heartache and heartbreak because we know that death was defeated for Jarius and for us by him who is the resurrection of life, one who conquered death forever. So when you talk about those three days, why those three days are so glorious, why Easter Sunday is so glorious, we all used to dress up in our little nice outfits on Easter. What makes Easter so glorious and why it should be, the, like your mother said, that we're Easter people, the reason why that's so important, because that's when death is conquered. I mean, he, he, I will be back. And he tells them in John, he tells them in John 14, I go and prepare a place for all eight of us. I, I, he said, I prepare a place for you. In my father's house, there are many mansions. I prepare a place for you. And I told, that's why I tell this young woman, I said, now I got to be honest with you. I'm going to agree with that before I agree with Elon Musk. And she just looked at me. And I said, I'm serious. You putting your faith in the school of business and getting making a lot of money. I said, one cancer diagnosis can change your life. Mm -hmm. So you see, so I said, there's nothing wrong with having money. There's nothing wrong with striving to be your best. But what I told my kids, I said, listen, I said, can I be honest? I told my daughter and son, can I be honest with you? One day I said, I'm going to fail you. Big time. I'm going to fail you. They look at me like, what do you mean? He says, have I disappointed you? They say, oh yeah, but I said, no, I'm going to fail you. Don't put your faith in me. Because I ain't going to get it right all the time. So I said, you've got to be something great. That's what we were talking about that Sunday school thing, Jim. That's what I was trying to tell kids. Let kids decide. Let young people decide. But you bring them. And that between them and God. Because God's going to say to every one of us, what did you do with my name, Charles? What did you do with my name when you were in that floor shop? When you were making those beautiful flowers and you were talking to that. What, what did you do with my name, Charles, when you were sitting there talking with that professor who you didn't agree with? What did you do with my name? I always tell people, you know, when people say to me, they did this to me, Charles, and I'm not going to forgive them. Like, okay, cool. That's your, that's your right, free will. But what, 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 what did you want to do with that? And I, and I say that's the, so the sting of death is this, that we have it on this side. But what our prayer is that one day, one day, as this next lesson says, I'll see you again. And it says here, on the last final day, it says, so you have pain now. But I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. It says, in the midst of sorrows and consolation, in the midst of darkness is light, in the midst of despair and hope, and in the midst of Babylon and the glimpses of Jerusalem, and in the midst of the army of demons, is the consoling angel, the cap of sorrow, unconceivable as it seems, and it's a cup of joy. I'll see you when you get back, she yelled to her husband as he rolled off on his motorcycle. But tragically, tragically, he never came back alive. And I thought of that accident, accident. this morning. You know, when I was, we, so I got to work at 8.30. And um, we were supposed to have a welcome for two of our new staff members. And my boss and the other director couldn't get there. Because it was a major accident. I was, and I, every time I think of a major accident, I get real, you know, I start praying. And two people died. 
I heard that, and I understand there's an Amazon truck involved, was, and, yeah. right, and everything. You know, caught fire. Right, huh? It caught fire. Yeah. Caught fire, right. And um, two people died. And I thought of when those people were perishing, who did they last talk to? Who did they hug? Who did they kiss? I have been purposely doing this, and, I, and it's interesting. I've always said to thee, I love you, right, when I leave the house. But I've been purposely running to her and hugging her and kissing her. I don't know why. I just, just have um, when I go to work. And um, because we don't know what another day will bring. And I, and I have shared this to people that, you know, if somebody didn't wake up this morning, right? And um, when I was at this funeral Sunday, Friday, Monday, the family were grieving, but they were so rejoicing. And, and the daughter who came up to me, the oldest daughter said, God told me, have your father at 100 years old, or have this father at 65. She said, I take this father at 65, Charles, three times over. He was the greatest father I could have ever had on earth, you know. And that, for me, she said, because I know where he's at. And I'm going to be there. So, um, this lesson reminds us, and this reminds us, of the, and this is the cross as we come to the end of this. Tomorrow is not promised for us. And Jesus wants to remind us, so you have pain now, but I will see you again. And your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. And what Jesus is trying to tell us here is that, yes, you're here now. And death may come upon you. But just know the joy, as the psalm says, comes in the morning. So I, I didn't want to have, I want to have, see if anybody has any concluding comments concerning this. I'll see you again. But this is what Jesus told his disciples next week when we do this, when we do our Monday service and we uh, do a feet, and we're going to do a feet washing here, but when they did the feet washing, Jesus says, I'll see you again. And Peter said, ain't nobody going to hurt you. I got your back. I got your back. And Jesus says, Peter, Peter, Peter. Charles, Charles, Charles. You're going to deny me three times, bro, before the night's over. You know? And because God knows our shortcomings. He, he knows them better than us. And, I, and I, I'll be honest with you, I take joy in that. I take joy in the thinking if, I, if I'm if i hiding a thought, Jesus is like, yeah, I know that. Oh, come on. You're hiding a thought, so I know stuff. One of the things that's, that's always bothered me is I, is it, I think that, in my perspective, too many times churches are looking at, at humans mm -hmm. as being bad. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, do we really think that God put people on earth because he's such an empty bad? And, and what's the definition of, 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 of bad. bad all the time? Right. 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 And, and as far as, you know, your question about uh, somebody asking you, if, 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 how do you know mm -hmm. that, that, that there's a God? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, how do you know the sun's going to come up tomorrow morning? Right. Right, right. I mean, if you study, you know, uh, astronomy and anything like that, uh, the, the, the bad vastness of our universe, the, mm -hmm. the, it's the fact that we whirl around and kept by some unknown force right. in perspective. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. And, and, I, and, I, and I will say this to you, you're right. And I also want to add to that real quick. I think Satan, I mean, I think the enemy is putting blinders on people's eyes when it comes to not coming to church because of people. Now, that, that's loaded what I just said, but I mean that. I really believe that Satan has literally made people believe that, you know what, you don't have to be in fellowship with other people. That you don't have to lift my name. That you don't have to work out your differences. I think, I think, and I think people have gotten to this place in life 
And I think the church, I think we, as a church, and I'm saying not just the congregation, I'm talking about the church, I think we as a church are really kind of missing the boat in the respect of what we expect from people. You know what I mean? And I think, when you think about 100 years ago in this church, this, this ceiling, these walls, these doors, things were packed. Why were they doing that? Right? Well, I'm going to tell you this much. I know this. I don't know how many TVs y'all grew up with, but I grew up with one. I'm just saying. Right? How many TVs you grew up with? And a whole bunch of TVs. You had six TVs in your house? <coughs> Right. Yeah, for wow, Jesus, wow, he was, he was rich. I grew up with one. Now I got a TV in every room, including the kitchen, the breakfast milk. <laughs> I'm just saying, there's enough to keep me away from reading that book. I'm telling you, I'm, when, I, when I was in, one of the most interesting things in seminary, we went to seminary, we were required in this one class to read. All day long, the class was just reference to reading Psalm 23 and John 3 for five days, all day. People in the corner sleeping. <laughs> Literally, people in the corner crying. People in the corner praying. We had people come back and people said to them, God said to them, I have missed you so much. We have you been. Mm. And, and my seminary professor said it best. How can you serve God and not give God one hour a day? He said, you have, he said, and this is what he said to us. This is my, for my first class, and I never got to John people. He said, the best gift you can ever give any of your congregation is the ability to spend time with God. So when they come to you with those issues, you got your spiritual muscles mm. to give them what God's saying, not what Charles is saying, right? So I say that to say that a lot of people, going back to what you're saying, is that a lot of people look at the church, and we haven't always done a better job of, this is what I've learned, y'all, and this is, but we better keep this in mind, this is my focus. Be careful when strangers come into this congregation. Hebrews 10.25 says, be careful how you treat people who come in, for you entertain angels and not know it. Because the angel ain't gonna always come in here flopping beautiful white <laughs> wings. They might come in here in the worst of circumstances just to check us out. To say, should I come to the congregation of church, Charles, or should I go to the Metropolitan, or should I go to the cathedral? You know, I mean, that's why I love being an usher. Because you greet people. Mm. And I'm telling you, there's no better way to greet people, greet, make people feel welcome. Because you don't know what they're bringing in. You don't know what's on their heart. That person could have decided to commit suicide. And God said, go to the congregation church. That person could have decided that I'm not going to let this person keep beating me upside my head. I'm going to church. I just want to give up and come to church. And that's why we have to always, one way or another, be on our best. Even when it's as... Elder Jocelyn Hart used to say, fake it till you make it. <laughs> fake it till you make it. Be nice. Yeah. If you don't feel like being nice, we that because that's our charge. Uh, coming to church should, in, in, in my opinion, coming to church should be a joyous experience. Of course, it shouldn't be. A, it shouldn't be you come to church because you're on, you know, on your knees and begging right. for forgiveness. And mm -hmm. I mean, uh, 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 Joan and I, when we lived in, in Bronson, I uh, used to go to Montreal a lot. And there, there's a place in Montreal where one of the one of the holiest houses. You know, people were supposed to crawl up the steps on their knees. <laughs> you know, you know. And I remember thinking, what, what so many this is this? And, you know, why, you know, right. church experience shouldn't be one of guilt and, and discomfort. It should be a happy... It should, it should be a place of happiness and strength. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, you come to get strength. I get coming to, I'm coming to hang out with you guys, but, you know, I had a bad week. I need a word, Brother Jim. I need a word, John. I need a word, Rules. Give me, give me that song. 
That's why we come. You're right. We do. Because I always say to people, y'all crawling on your knees. And I'm like, oh, but Jesus took care of that, y'all. He wants you to come and bask. And he wants you to bask in his love. <coughs> you know, he wants to bask in your he wants to bask. He wants you to come to church and get a word and get a, an encouragement and hear it's gonna be okay. This is how you handle that next week. It's gonna be okay. Go see Joe on Tuesday. Joe gonna be okay. And that's what you we need to hear that. We need we need to know. You're right. We gotta come and encourage. It's nothing more worse than dealing with the world five, six days and then coming here. And catching hell in church. <laughs> it's just something wrong with that. And that's why some people leave. That's why some people won't come. And listen, I'm gonna tell you when children come in, when children start coming to this church when they when, when and, and they will. I don't want none of y'all stopping them from coming in the pulpit and sitting with me. <laughs> if a child wants to come sit in the pulpit, let them come and sit in the pulpit. Right. And if you want us to talk during your service, let them talk. Let them talk. Right? That's why when my, I had Clay's grandson in the corner, he was talking, he was in my eight and had, I had Rob in the front, and I had Josiah in the back. That's, and that's okay. It's okay. That's okay. You know, and, and that's what we need, y'all. We, we need to make, because our children need to remember. I remember that bald head man I remember the other ball had man playing the piano. Excuse me. <laughs> but, but, but that's what that's what we that's what that's what we need to get back because the, because we need it. We need it. We we need it. So let's close in prayer. If you have any other questions? I want I want to close in prayer. Um, you know what? Lewis, close us in prayer. Close us in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for this time of fellowship and study. We experienced good sharing tonight. It is my prayer for us that this sharing will seep into our hearts and minds and will be ever more present through Christ in our thoughts, our minds, our hearts, and in our actions. We come toward Palm Sunday and Holy Week, and we walk with you on that journey, and we carry that through our lives, and carry that to others. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, guys. One more, one more Wednesday. <laughs> then we'll take a break, and we'll get back at it again. <laughs> Thanks, God.